So who do we turn to for entertainment news now that the geniuses at Global have shut down ET Canada? We turn to today's guest, this country's first lady of entertainment news. I'm Bill Brio, and welcome to another episode of Brio TV, the podcast. Well, it had been way too many years since I last spoke with Cheryl Hickey, who rose from a small town in Ontario to become a broadcast leader in Canada. Even though a lot of time had passed, it really seemed like we had always kept in touch. Well, you've known her and loved her for 18 seasons on ET Canada, where she helped promote and introduce Canada's entertainment stars. Please welcome Cheryl Hickey. Cheryl, it's so great to see you this morning. It's so nice to see you, too. It's been a minute, you and I. Oh, my God. You know, I think we first met uh, when you took me up in a helicopter, uh, right? <laughs> I remember, I think I was working for the Toronto Sun, and yeah. you were doing uh, reports on uh, traffic, uh, I, I assume now. Uh, no. Uh, weather? It wasn't traffic. No, it was, I was, back then, uh, the very first woman or female camera operator to switch or TD and shoot from a helicopter and report. So I was doing three things. Uh, I never did traffic. Everyone thinks I did traffic and weather. Those are two things that I would have done, but I didn't. I was a, a camera woman up there and also uh, did a lot of reporting. So in the day I would go and shoot my story, rip to the airport, and I would do the bumper shots for the news and then also intro my story that I shot for the day. So yeah, I just but I remember, remember you. Well, that's I'm, that's great to hear. I mean, it was a memorable uh, occasion for me. I just I just thought, oh my God, you're doing everything. Um, it was really impressive, and uh, uh, you know, and and it was very exciting. That might have been the first time I'd been up in a helicopter. How many trips did you make? You know, it must have been over a hundred, right? Oh, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. And you know what? I do remember that article because that was the first time I was ever featured in anything ever. And my mom still has the clipping. <laughs> I still have That's a clipping sweet. of it. Nice. And the funny thing is my daughter has seen it. And she said to me, where are your eyebrows? And I'm like, what? <laughs> so this was before you do. I knew enough. Yeah. that When you have flash or any kind of big light, you must draw your eyebrows and they disappear. So that anyway, so that's one of the funny things. Whenever I think about that article, that's my daughter is like, where's your eyebrows? And my mom is like, she's got copies of it. So, that's awfully what sweet. Your question? Well, I don't even remember what the question was. Oh, neither do I. I've just I've loved hearing this, that your mom has a copy of that story. That's pretty cool. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, she must be very, very proud of you. Um, you know, that uh, both of your parents, I know, and, and condolences, your your father passed away earlier this year. Um, Thank you. Very, very sad. But he must have been very proud of you as well. Right. I mean, uh, right. Mm -hmm. People he must have stopped them was. and talked to you about all, all, the, all the time. Right. Yeah, he really was. And I think, you know, my dad was a person who always and my mom. Um, we're like, just go for it. Just go for it. If you fall flat in your face, you fall flat in your face, but you've got to try. You've got to, you've got to push. And when I was offered the job here in Toronto, um, I was terrified. I'd never driven in a city. I was from Owen Sound, right? Like yeah, I'd never yeah. driven in Toronto. Um, no concept of that big of a city. I was terrified. And I was stepping into a job that was, like two levels above what I was already doing because when I was at the new VR in various, I was a camera woman, but this job was, Oh, you're going to be a camera woman, but you're also going to be on air as a videographer. But also there's this new technology that we want to teach you up in a helicopter and we want you to learn this. And that's going to be your day one. And I remember being like, ah, uh, let me think about it. And my parents, my dad was like, no, no, no it's go time. Like, let's go. If you're scared, that means we're leaning into something good. And I but, almost turned the job down. How wild is that? Well, it does sound like uh, you're auditioning for fear factor. You know, I mean, this is a lot to, lot to take on. Most people, when they're starting a job, yeah, they yeah. don't have to go up in a helicopter. Um, well, let's talk a bit about, um, 
you know, uh, your, your roots uh, as we are. Uh, I was always fascinated that you were from Own Sound. Uh, my family's had a cottage up on the Bruce for since oh, before I was born. And nice. so I've driven through Own Sound a million times. And uh, I once I remember hitchhiking back from Own Sound, getting a ride from yeah. the editor of the uh, Own Sound uh, Sun Times, right? Yeah. yeah. And and uh, so it's a great, great city, but, you know, probably under 25,000, 30,000 population, right? Definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the funny thing, though. I actually wasn't born in Owen Sound, but I say Owen Sound because because it's it's more well known. I was actually born in a place called Shallow Lake. Oh, Which I know Shallow Lake. Is on the way. Well, so you would have driven through Shallow Lake, right? There, there's 45 people in Shallow Lake. Thank you. Well, there's 500 actually. And um, you know where our house was? <laughs> no. Do you know? Because if you know this area, this yeah. is a small town talk, you and I. Yes. Okay. So, you know, when you come out of Shallow Lake, you pass by the Ed Allen's store, yes. but then you go on the highway and there's a little white church that only houses like five people. Yes. So do you know the White House right across from that? That's where I grew up. Oh my God, Cheryl! I've actually I've my picture taken when I'm like seven in front of that little yes. church. Yeah, yes. uh, that's where I played every day as a kid. We would cross oh, the highway. That's and amazing. And we would go and play there. Wow, you can get yeah. the best ice cream for like two dollars and fifty cents at, at the general yeah. store and on and shallow that's lake. At, that's at Allen's store that we got our penny candy and yeah. we did all the things there. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, they had a great antique market there. I don't know if it's as before COVID, but it was incredible at the community center. Yes. Uh, so people listening, you're all this is all the Shallow Lake news you'll ever going to get. But this is fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you were from Shallow Lake, then did you moved to Own Sound, your family. Uh, and yeah. uh, from what I understand, when you were like 15 or 16, you already were interested in this kind of a career and you started to volunteer at a community cable channel. Is that true? Yeah. So I spent most of my summers going to Sobel Beach. Of course. And I was going to Dunes parties at night. And what that is, someone would bring a pickup and you'd put a generator on the pickup and you would party in the middle of the dunes all night, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. And by day, we would go and play volleyball and listen to music and da da da. That was what you did in the day. Yeah. And at one point my dad was like, Okay, listen. Party's over. You need to <laughs> you need to figure out what are you doing. And aside from because I was working at like Smitty's and uh, a couple others places, you know, as a hostess. But he's like, it's time to like, what are we doing? So we were sitting there one day and a crawl came across the bottom of the screen. And it said looking for volunteers at McLean Hunter. I think it was McLean Hunter at the time. Yeah. McLean Hunter Cable. And he looked at me and he said, you talk a lot. I feel like there's something we could do with this. And I was always fascinated with Barbara Walters and Oprah Winfrey. Like those were the shows that I gravitated towards. My mom and I would watch all of the, you know, the date lines and all the things. And he's like, let's just go. I'm going to drive you up. Let's just go. So we jump in the car, we go and we have a tour. And I was immediately, immediately fascinated by the number of jobs under one roof From, I remember seeing someone roll a teleprompter and a cameraman and a writer. And then I walked in another room and there was an editor. And then I walked in another room and there was a script writer. And I was like, wait, uh, oh, and you could do that or you could do that or you could do. And that many pieces of putting a broadcast together or a story together. And that kind of just like, it, it lit me up. So I went and I volunteered there for the rest of that summer. And I shot things and I edited things and I put things to music. And and remember, this is before TikTok and Instagram where kids yeah. are doing My daughter's eight and she does CapCut and does the videos I was doing back when I was in university. Wow. Like it's wild. Wow. So, but it lit something and I, I got very excited about it. And I guess that's partially why I love TikTok and Instagram now. It reignites that creativity in me that that I had back then. It's, 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 it's hands on. It's it's right in front of you. It's incredible. And how lucky were we? Cheryl, I also volunteered, did some shtick in at Etobicoke at McLean Hunter at, in Etobicoke yeah. with some friends. And again, had that same feeling. My goodness, what a playpen. All these toys are here. We Playpen. get to use it, even if it means we have to come in at mi- midnight or one of the morning. Yeah. Um, yes. and, and, and what a tragedy, this lost resource throughout in communities across North America, because I just felt that was a wonderful place to dip your toe, wasn't it? 
It really was. It was a great place to learn, to make mistakes, to not have to be perfect. Yeah. I think that, you know, that that's the one thing that kind of breaks my heart for the younger generation of journalists and, and certainly creators mm. is when you are learning to create and when you are learning to find your voice, you're going to make mistakes and you're you're not going to get it right. And you're going to figure you're, you're figuring it out, you know, and when there aren't cable stations and there aren't smaller stations to get your feet wet and to really learn that that's really hard. And it's people aren't going to get it right out of the gate. And that's that's challenging. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and then uh, take me from there. You go to uh, the new VR in Barrie. Is that uh, was that the yeah. process? Yeah. Yeah, I went. I uh, so in college we had an internship, and I wanted to do something close to home. So I found the the, the new VR in Barrie, <clears throat> and then I kept hounding the news director at the time. Um, and right before he left, he hired me for an opening position as a writer for the six o'clock news. Wow. That was where I first developed my, my, uh, stage fright. I, it took me like an hour one day to write a tease because I was like, it's going to come out of his mouth and it's going to go on the news. <laughs> and I couldn't, I had stage fright, writer's block, all the things, whatever it is. Sure. And I remember someone coming over and putting their hand around me and being like, it's just a tease. It's just, a t I'm like, I know, but he's going to say it. So r understanding the complexity of it, like I had to overcome that immediately, but it wow. was big. And then from there, I would shadow the cameramen and women as like, I would finish my shift at six mm -hmm. and I would ask them if I could come out with them at night. And I'd take one of the old cameras that was in the shop and use it and follow them and copy them doing whatever they were doing that night. Wow. Wow. So then I would get a tripod and when they were maybe doing something with the reporter, I would record my own stand up. So then at 11 o'clock, I would go back. And when they were done with the edit bays, I would edit my piece with my stuff in it. So I would often stay, as you said, till like three in the morning, editing that story the way I thought it should go. And then I would leave it on the desk of the new, there was a new uh, news director and leave it on his desk. I later come to find out, he was just storing them in a box under his desk and actually never looked at them <laughs> and told me I had no talent and that I oh. was going to amount to nothing. Well, you so, sure showed him. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. <laughs> that was my first lesson in when someone says no, say thank you very much and look the other way. Well, yeah. Cheryl, you know, your parents telling you to go for it, I think, and you yeah. really listened. I mean, that's impressive. And uh, also, uh, clearly. Naive. Yeah, no, but but uh, also you had the presence to make sure you were ready to go for it, uh, uh, that you you trained yourself and had others train you uh, and, and had this progression. But is there something, I'm, I'm just curious, and this is maybe a cliche, but coming from a small town, is this idea of being in television and, uh, you know, being the, uh, Barbara Walters or somebody involved in this business, uh, do you think that's a, an even stronger pull coming from Owen Sound than it might have been from um, Toronto? Um, well, I certainly, I kept visualizing me being there. I'll, oh. I'll tell you, that's sort of what I, I kept having it in my brain being mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do this. But I knew in my heart that no one was going to give it to me because I was, I mean, I was very proud to be from Owen Sound and Shallow Lake. Like, mm -hmm. That's my heart. Yeah. But nobody was going to give me anything because of that. So I knew that I had to get all the skills, all the skills, camera woman, writer, producer, on-air talent whenever I could, um, because I needed to be prepared, as you said, for if and when the door of opportunity opened for me, mm -hmm. I could jump. And know that I had the education, the background, the experience to not fall flat on my face. Did it mean that I I, I didn't I learned as I went? I learned to be a quick learner. Mm -hmm. um, but being and you, ready is and important. You, and, and you studied at uh, Fanshawe College. Is that true? Yeah, did, I, radio I, and TV. Yeah, I did. I studied at Fanshawe, um, but I also, as a kid, I was making videos for my parents and <laughs> editing them together with start and stop always. Yeah. And so I was making, I was doing things back then when I think now 
I was doing things to prepare myself for later. Like I used to make up shows in my, with, on my camcorder with my sister. And when I was at the new VR in Barrie, one of the programmers came up to me and said, okay, Hickey, I've got five minutes in between young and the restless. And new, it was something. No, it was it was days of our life and news. I think it was. He said, if I gave you that five minutes, what would you do with it? And I was like, give me one day and I'll tell you. So I went home and I was like, what will I do with that? And I was like, okay, I'm going to start a show and I'm going to get people to email me and ask me questions about the soap opera. Then I'm going to get in touch with a soap opera expert from Soap Opera Digest, which was Nelson Branco. Do you remember Nelson? Oh, yes, I do. Yep. And I wrote Nelson and said, if I send you questions from viewers, will you answer them? And he said, yes. Wow. So I went back to that program director and I said, I've, I've got it. That five minutes, I'm going to take things from viewers and I'm going to get a soap opera expert and then I'm going to add them for five minutes every day. He's like, you think you can fill it? And I was like, absolutely. He goes, where are you going to shoot it? I said, I don't know. I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> so then he, I go and I'm like, where am I going to shoot this? So I was friends with the maintenance men. That's the other thing. If anybody younger in the industry is, is, is listening, make friends with everyone, not just the people you think that you're going to benefit from. Yeah, the Don't security people. guy. The guy on the door at security is the most important A person, thousand right? Percent. So <laughs> I was friends with the maintenance guy. Mm -hmm. So I went to him and I said, is there anywhere in this building that I can have a set? And he was like, oh, hecky. I said, I know, but is there anywhere? He's like, well, in the in the loading bay where the trucks are, the satellite trucks are, we've got an old tiny makeup room. I'll give it to you, um, but you're going to have to do it yourself. You'll have to clean it out. You're going to have to do whatever you want to do. And I said, done. And I said, another thing, do you have a can of paint, any paint? And he said, I've got, a, I've got some lilac paint, but it's really old. I was like, done, I'll take it. So I paid <laughs> four in the morning and I painted that old makeup room lilac found old pieces like a like a ceramic cat that later became like a co-host and <laughs> made it my own set and then i went back to the program director and i said this is what i'm going to do and he let me do it and i think that was my first on air it worked really well people bit onto it the only unfortunate part about that is i couldn't think of a name and we had a lot of smart asses working at the new vr and barry and i say that with love Right. And one of the girls whips her head out the door and says, I know what you should call it. You call it lather up with Cheryl Hickey because it's a soap opera thing. And I was like, no, 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 no one's going to take me seriously. And the program director was like, done. That's what it's called. Wow. My dad was so mad at me. He's like, <laughs> you people are going to think it's like something else. And what is this? And da, 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 da. Anyway. That's a stroke funny. of genius. Lather up with Cheryl Hickey. I, I thought. It was. I thought you were going to call it Ceramic Cat, which which also would be a good name. <laughs> it was, the it Ceramic was. Cat. But the funny thing is when I left, someone else took it over. And I think it continued for like two or three years oh, after that. that. It's amazing. So, so be creative. I think that's my message to younger well, people. If there, there's no blueprint, make your own. Yeah, that's brilliant. We'll be back with Cheryl Hickey in just a moment. This month, it is Goodbye Seattle, Hello Again Boston, as Frasier returns to television, this time in a brand new series streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Kelsey Grammer, who played the fussy psychiatrist for 20 consecutive seasons on Cheers and Frasier, returns as Dr. Frasier Crane. Now, I have to admit, I was skeptical at first, especially when I heard Grammer would be supporting himself with an entirely new cast. Did it before, however, and quite successfully on Frasier. And having seen the first three episodes of this new series, he's done it again. Frasier moves back to Boston, where he reconnects with his son, Freddie, played by Jack Cudmore Scott. He also returns to Harvard, where he gets reacquainted with his old pal, Alan, played by Nicholas Lindhurst. And for those of us who miss Fraser's brother, Niles, meet Niles and Daphne's son and Fraser's nephew, David. Definitely a chip off the old germophobic block. So say cheers to a brand new Fraser premiering October 12th with new episodes available to stream every Thursday. And remember, there's a mountain of entertainment on Paramount+. Plus.
What's new this month on Super Channel? Well, for one thing, get ready to meet the royal mob. Think the Sopranos were a murderous crime family? Forget about it. Fact is, Great Britain's royal family had control of much of Europe and beyond under Queen Victoria. The royal mob is told through the eyes of Her Highness's favorite granddaughters, each of whom married into European royal courts. The series combines scripted drama with commentary from expert historians to tell the tale of one of the most compelling, powerful, yet dysfunctional families in history. The Royal Mob premieres October 15th on Super Channel Fuse. And remember, Super Channel, an all-Canadian service, is available via most cable providers across the country, as well as streaming live and on demand with Amazon Prime Video Channels and Apple TV+. Check out the new streaming channel, Super Channel Plus, available now on the Roku platform in Canada. And we're back with the pride of Shadow Lake, Ontario, Cheryl Hickey. So um, there's, uh, I guess, word of an opportunity at uh, Global. Uh, how did you make your way from the VR to uh, to Toronto? Yeah. So uh, one of the cameramen, I guess, was really, really good friends with a gentleman named Paul Rogers. Oh, I heard of him. Paul yeah. Rogers, Paul <laughs> Rogers uh, was the new dir- news director at uh, Global Television. Yeah. And I guess they were buddies. And I guess, I think his name was Greg, said to Paul, there's a girl you need to meet. Uh, you just need to meet her. So one day out of the blue, I get this phone call from this guy, Paul Rogers. I think it's a joke. I'm like, okay. He said, I'd like to drive up to Barry and I'd like to take you out for a coffee. It's like, okay. Again, still kind of being like, hmm, right. This stuff doesn't happen. So now remember, I had been sending my audition tapes to my news director mm-hmm. at the new VR for a good year, almost every day. Like every other day. And Paul comes up and I have to tell you, I was panicked because I had all things that you wear when you're a cameraman, right? You're not, I'm not wearing a suit. So I went to Le Chateau. I got a burgundy pinstripe suit (laughs) and I was ready to go. And I remember sitting in my little car before the meeting being like, what if he asked me what my five-year plan is? I don't know what my five-year plan is. Like, that's always the question people ask you, right? So anyway, I went in, had a wonderful meeting with him. Uh, he did ask me what my plan was. And I, you know, I basically just said, I want to keep growing and I want to, I want to be on air and I did it, all the things. And then literally the next day he offered me a job. He said, there's this new position opening up. It's this, it's this, it's this. What do you think? And I was like, I'll get back to you. <laughs> As the fear set in. I've, ne- like I said, never driven in Toronto. I really wanted to be on air in Barrie because it was comfortable. Um, da, 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 da. So I went to my news director in Barrie and I said, hey, this opportunity has come up. I really, really want to stay in Barrie. And if you, is there anything you can do here where I can start developing my on air presence and doing the things? And he said, no, no, I don't see it for you. Really? And he said, I, he said, what I could do is you could get a story on the 11 o'clock on a Sunday, but that means you'd have to work a double shift or something like that. And I was like, I'll think about it. That was my response. I'll think about it because well, I. It, would, would there have been a better answer for you at that point than no? From him? Yeah. I mean, that to me, it seems like nobody's going to tell you no, right? I don't know. I he he didn't believe in me at all. And he said so in many other different ways. Mm. So he said, you're just it's just not for you. And I went away and I went and talked to the six o'clock news anchor whose name is Lance Chilton. And actually two months ago, I called Lance about something else. And I just said to him, I just want to say thank you again, because you did change my life. Wow. He said to me, if you don't go, it will be the biggest mistake of your life. He said, you need to trust me, kiddo, and you need to go. You need to be scared and you need to go. He was absolutely right. And what were you were like 21? How old were you now? At that yeah, point? I was 20, 21. <laughs> oh my God. And here's the hard part. I went to my then new. So then I gave my notice and I was a one week into my two week notice. And the news director pulled me into his office 
And he yelled at me for 45 minutes. And I remember looking at my watch and I was crying and very upset, not saying great things. And his secretary was sitting there and she had her head down. And he's, I remember so boldly him saying, you remember, I made you who you are. I made you who you are, is what he said. And with that, he paraded me through the newsroom, wouldn't let me get my purse and escorted me out of the building. Holy crap. What an abusive yeah. loser. It wasn't great. But what I will say, and the reason I tell that story is because nobody makes you who you are. And oh. I took the lessons, the good and the bad yeah. from that situation and used it as fuel, not as anger, because anger doesn't serve you. I used it as fuel to prove him and myself wrong. Wow. What a great so that story. Day, lovingly, I had all my coworkers came out to my car, surrounded my car. Wow. And were wonderful. The most beautiful, wonderful people. Yeah. And I was like, okay, here we go. Giddy up. And my very first day at global TV was the very first day I ever drove in Toronto. And my first assignment was at the airport. Oh, oh my God. I was terrified. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. It's terrifying now. I was worse. I mean, to, yeah. to, I yeah, live near the really airport. Is. It's horrifying. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is a place where you drive every day, uh, you know, because you, you, the helicopter took took off from Pearson, didn't it? Uh, Pearson and Buttonville. So I oh, okay. commuted from Barrie because okay. I was very resistant on, I was terrified, as I said, and I commuted from Barrie. My shift was 3.30 to 11. So I commuted back and forth um for quite a while but yes it was it was pearson and buttonville back and forth amazing and in my memory i used to be work at tv guide at this point and i would go yeah. to global on fridays and uh yeah. talk to bob mcadory who i dearly loved wonderful mm -hmm. man and mm -hmm. uh but the entertainment they, they had the three nice guys at noon at uh, at uh global yeah. news at that point yeah. bob was one of them and their entertainment uh, desk was literally a desk <laughs> in, yes. front of, in front of a bad brick wall yes uh, and uh elaine loring uh, an old friend was part yes. of that mix, but it was a very um, homemade. It was almost uh, just a step above uh, um, your your uh, lavender uh, show, your your cat yes. ceramic cat yes. set. Um, <laughs> so it, it definitely needed to be uh, upgraded. But this is what the the environment you kind of stepped into, and it kind of uh, took a huge leap forward from there, didn't it? Yeah, I remember when Bob was there in Elaine, and I remember they closed the entertainment section. I yeah. believe they, they shut it all down. I don't remember what the reason was and what the, the rationale was behind it. Mm -hmm. But I think there were for a few months, maybe a year, I don't even know, there wasn't any entertainment. It was just, it went dark. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was making a transition from news I started gravitating towards what they called back then was the kicker stories. And the reason I did that is because I found myself when I was working in news, I was working that late shift and I was doing stories like horrendous stories. I mean, Toronto has a lot of, there's a lot of things yeah. that happen here. And, um, the, you know, not, I, I found that I was taking home the essence and the feelings of these parents who were losing their kids that I had to go and interview mm. or knocking on their door and saying, can I have a picture of your son who just passed for the 11 o'clock news? And just before you continue, I'll just mention like, you know, uh, I was, uh, I went to university of Toronto and, and the summers um, I would work as a court constable uh, down yeah. at the courthouse at 361 university. My uncle was a deputy sheriff and this was a great, well-paying job. But one of the things I was thinking at the time was, well, maybe I'll become a lawyer, you know, maybe law is the thing. And I remember yeah. um, being on the docket with all these people in this courtroom. And I just uh, felt after a while, um, I don't want to deal with all this unhappiness. I don't want to be the guy trying to unravel all of this stuff because it's just drags me down and not not fun uh and also i guess i didn't want to make a lot of money <laughs> but anyway <laughs> but but i really felt that was sort of a message and it sounds like you got a similar message from doing these these uh, terrible news stories right i did and the, and the one that was the straw that broke the camel's back i suppose was i was this story that was in the beaches 
mother's daughter had gotten hit by a car and I was to go live from the memorial site at 5.30. And I was standing there going live and I remember hearing my news director say, the mom has just arrived on the scene. Go over and talk to the mother. And my soul fell into my stomach. And I turned around and there she was kneeling at the memorial site of where her daughter had passed. Mm -hmm. And I walked over and everything in my body was like, I can't, this is not me. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing? So, and it's funny, I, I can't tell you if I interviewed the mom. I, I blocked it out. I don't wow. know. Wow. But I, I do remember that evening I had to take the story further as you do for 11. And I had to go to the mother's house and I said, can I, can I come to your house? Do you have any pictures that you would like to share with everyone? And I go to the house and the mother was in such shock that she invited me in. And again, I was a videographer, so I was by myself with the camera, just me, no producer, no nothing. And I go in and she's like, just sit here. And I sat down and cause they had a basement apartment and I sat down and it was on, turned out to be the daughter's bed. So I sat there and I looked around and realized what I was now, what was happening. And she starts pulling clothes out of the closet and says, I, you should have some of this stuff. You guys were the same size. I realized she was in shock. She wasn't making good decisions. Oh. To which then I said, I think it's time for me to go. And I left. And I made the hard decision in that drive that I couldn't, I'm not that person, that I couldn't do it. And not to say that there's anything wrong with people that do, because we do need people who can tell those stories and objectively cut themselves off and do it right. Like, yeah. right? I am not her. At the time, I was not her. I was in my 20s. I felt too much. I didn't know how to energetically, as you said, protect myself from someone else's pain, um, all of that. So I started to gravitate towards these kicker stories, the Rob Davidson stories. He right. did it brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And I loved it because it takes a lot of intelligence, I think, to take nothing and make it into something that yeah. makes people laugh and feel something. So that's, I started to gravitate towards that. Paul Rogers, again, lovingly saw what was happening. And he said, he pulled me into his office and he said, there's something quirky about you. So let's <laughs> keep moving in this direction. And I did. And then they started to bring back slowly entertainment updates. And that's sort of how it all rolled. When did you hear that there was a, a chance of, of launching entertainment tonight, this incredible brand in the United States, such a powerful show. When did you hear that was uh, maybe going to come to global? Well, not till the day they offered it to me. I didn't know it was entertainment tonight. Canada. Really? So the story goes, I was doing my news things and little entertainment hits. Like when the backstreet boys would come to town, I would go down and do lives at five 30 and all those kinds of things. Like living the life, having fun. And then I heard that they were going to do an entertainment show at global. Now, remember, for the past few months, I'd been going in my burgundy pinstripe suit up to Barb Williams and her office <laughs> and with a manila envelope pitching ideas like I should be entertainment tonight's Canadian correspondent or I should be ridiculous. Oh, my God. Like, and who did I think I was to go and have a meeting with Barb Williams? Number one, she's like the most powerful woman in television. And I think I can march up to her office. God love her. She gave me the time of day. She didn't need to. <laughs> Cheryl, is there a greater mentor uh, for oh. for women, particularly in Canada oh. in television, than Barb Williams? Right? She is a powerhouse. Yeah. Um, another person I owe so much to: uh, Paul Rogers, Barb Williams. Um, so I heard there was going to be an entertainment show. So in between doing my shift, I kept seeing. These models and actors, they would literally walk by my cubicle to go audition for this show. And I was like, I got, I have to audition. Like, I got to give it a go. So I asked for an audition. I went in and I remember there was a guy named Jeff Zed Shalev, someone else, and right. Roz Wecker sitting there. Wow. And I went in and I read with this other guy. And as I read and then it was over and I was done and I had to go back and edit my story. <laughs> so few days pass by and I keep seeing like the Monica Schneers, like the most beautiful people <laughs> and talented people. And I'm like, every time they'd walk by, I was like, oh, I'm definitely not getting the job. I am, oh, for sure not getting the job. There's no way. 
you know, but still and, and just to say, uh, just for some who might not, Monica Schneider was a supermodel, right? She was, you know, mm-hmm. Canadian, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Supermodel. And like these sportscasters were coming, like everyone and their brother came in on audition for the show. <laughs> and I, in my mind was like, oh yeah, no, I get it. No, no, no. And then, but still in my brain, while I was saying over here, I'm not going to get it. There was something in my brain that was saying, you've got this. There was this thing knowing that there was going to be a change, a knowing. So I went in to Zev's office and he said, here's the deal. I think it was Zev. And they said, we're not looking for someone like you. And I knew that in television, it's filling a role, right? Right. They're building a cast. They know what they're looking for. And he said, we don't want a blonde hair, blue eyed girl that people know. We just don't. And I said, got you. I'm blonde hair, blue eyed. It's not going to work. So I went and I was like, okay, well, at least I know. So I'm like, what? I now have unearthed something in myself knowing that I need change. Something has been unearthed. So I need to go and think about this. So I did the logical thing and I went and saw a boy uh, in Australia for three weeks. (laughs) (laughs) And he had no problem. He had no problem with a blonde haired, blue eyed lady, did he? No, but I I was like, I know there's a change. So I need uh, a change of scenery to go and sit with myself and be like, what am I, what's, what am I going to do? So I came back and my plan was to start looking for other work. And because I knew I wanted more, I just didn't know what the more was. And I don't know the exact period of time, but time went by. And then I got a call saying, can you please come down to, it was the Eaton Center. There was this big tower and I, it was a lawyer's office. Can you please come down to this office? And mm. I was like, Ooh. and I guess a lot of people were going down there. And I thought, oh, they're just going to give me the courtesy of telling me I didn't get the job because they have to, you know, do the thing. And I was like, okay. So I remember it was raining that day. I was driving down the DVP talking to my mom and my mom's like, here's the deal stay cool when they tell you you didn't get the job, just stay cool because this is, if it's not meant for you, there will be something else. You just need to stay focused. I was like, okay. So I get down there, get in the meeting, go up. I remember the table. I was looking out at two other buildings, trying not to look at them, but look over. So I didn't crack. And they said, here's, here's the thing. We'd like to offer you the job as host or co-host of the entertainment show that we're doing. And my whole body just went like, it was like, it just went numb. Nothing came out. And I love to talk. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember Barb Williams saying, are you okay? And I was like, "Mm mm-hmm. And she, and then Zev, I think said, and by the way, the show is Entertainment Tonight Canada. Uh, uh, And by the way, (laughs) your co-host will be Rick Campanelli. And again, my whole body just went like, what? at yeah. this point, Cheryl, Rick is best known from much music. He, he was Rick the Temp, right? This, he had a profile already, I think, at this point. Oh, right? he had a big profile. Uh, he was yeah. my every Sunday hungover with McDonald's recovering on the couch guy. Like that. <laughs> I watched Rick after I went out Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Right. And Sundays were my recovery watching music videos with Rick. Wow. Yeah, me so, too. Me too. Right? Hey. No, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> so I... It was a really big, and then all of a sudden, it was as though the rug was pulled out and we went into hyperspeed. Suddenly, there were CBS people in the building. We were talking wardrobe. We were talking glamour, like all the things that I knew nothing about, really. It went into hyperspeed. It must have. And, and, you know, Cheryl, fortunate, too, because my memory of Rick is a pretty nice guy. Right. You know, like that was maybe would have been a good pairing, I'm sure, for the two of you. He is one of the most. Roz and and Rick are two people who are so talented. It is I I can't I can't tell you, but also the nicest people. Mm -hmm. And they care so much and they have such big hearts. And it's. And it's really, really special. So, yes, to be able to do something like that, really with our whole team, Kim Dion, Rosie Etta, it was nice. really, it was a special time. And those guys came back for our final show. We invited them back. Nice. And when Rick and Roz walked into the room, and I didn't just say this, even some of our younger producers said it, there was a presence, there was a knowing, yeah. there was a thing. And I saw a 20-year-old 
producers fanboying over Rick and Roz. So you don't have to be our age to get it. Right. And that's the thing I think our industry needs to understand Mm -hmm. is because someone is of a certain age, it doesn't mean that they're not of interest. I think we need to erase that. Yeah. Oh, Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was a really spectacular thing for me to witness from the outside. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, it was great. What a wonderful start. Your stories are fantastic. Um, And uh, so Entertainment Tonight Canada launches. At what point, my memory is that that you had – uh, interaction with Mary Hart and John Tesh at some point too, didn't you? Didn't you meet the guys from the U.S. series? Or yeah, I did. I think one of the yeah, it was really wild. They sent me down to L.A. Hmm. and said, "We want you to do a cover shoot with uh, for TV Guide, and we want you to do it with Mark Steinis." And it was absolutely wild. I went down and I I met Mary Hart. And I saw her dressing room. Her dressing room was a cottage <laughs> on the, no, Kitty, no, no, no. It was a cottage. Of course it was. Of course it was. Yeah. No, it was a home. Oh my it God. Was, on the CBS lot. Yeah. There were dressing rooms above for guests, just for guests. And then you walk and you go to Mary's dressing room and Mary's dressing room was a cabin, had a living room, had a bathroom, had a kitchen had a bedroom. It was, it blew my mind. Blew I my think, mind. I think Le- Leonard Malton had to change in the men's room. I think that was my, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm buying buddies with Leonard. He's a film collector friend. Um, what did it go? Now, was this the CBS Radford lot or television city? Where did entertainment tonight? Uh, was it based? It wasn't the big, I think white- it was the Radford lot. I believe. Yeah, it prob- probably was. So just entering those gates and going in there, that must've been kind of cool. Right. Oh, it was unbelievable. It was, I was, yeah, it was a lot of the time coming out of my body being like, oh my gosh, are they going to ever figure out I don't know what I'm doing? Like at what point <laughs> is everyone going to be like, oh, wait a minute, we got the wrong girl. Not true. You know, that's, it was, yeah. So no, I was, uh, I was always in gratitude with it. And I was always, yeah, I don't know. I was always like watching from about like, what, I just, it was wild. It was very did- wild. Did you hear any words of wisdom from Mary Hart in terms of, you know, here, here's what to do or not to do, or she was just very welcoming? She was so lovely. She mm-hmm. just really was. So was Mark Steinis. They all were, even the producers. Everyone was always, that's the thing about entertainment tonight. They always were kind and saw us as the little sister, but didn't treat us like the little sister. Whenever we saw them on the red carpets, they'd always be like, come walk the red carpet with us, come get pictures. Let's do this. Let's we'll do opens with you. They often would co-host our show with us from time to time. It was a beautiful synergy and always generous and kind. Um, no, it was it was a really very cool time. And and talk to me about red carpets. This is a probably the hardest job in the world. You've got seconds to do something and say something that this person hasn't heard 4,000 times before already. Uh, What were some of, do you remember some encounters that were either great learning experiences or just surprisingly friendly and fun? Uh, Well, I figured out early on that my best formula was pulling out my Owen Sound and Shallow Lake personality. Nice. Because when I went too hard on, and it took me a while to learn that, but when I went too far into exactly what the producers wanted, it was just stale. So the more I went with like my natural, I'm curious about this, 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 and this, the better the interviews would go, the deeper the connection I felt with the person and the more fun we would have. So when I was on the red carpet, you know, I remember, I remember it was really cold. We were at the Grammys and my feet were cold and I had my boots over to the side. And I finally said, that's it with the shoes. Like I'm done grabbing my boots. They were big fuzzy boots. I put them on and all of a sudden Flo Rider came, <laughs> you know, he sings that song. I got the apple bottom jeans, boots with the fur. Anyway, he comes up and he's like, you've got the boots with the fur. And I'm like, I do. Cause it's freezing and I'm cold and my feet hurt. And I said, would you sing that song for me? And then all of a sudden he starts singing it and we're dancing. Oh. So it was moments like that yeah. um, that were really memorable. Those with Bruno Mars, Taylor Swift, seeing Rihanna wow. for the very first time, meeting her. 
um, John Mayer, uh, or being on the red carpet uh, in rehearsals when Whitney Houston passed, hearing that 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 happened, and then doing live hits back into Toronto 15 minutes after it happened. Like there are memories that will be in my mind yeah. forever, you know? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Don't go away. More with Cheryl Hickey after this short message. Time once again to speak with Emily Gagne from Hollywood Suite. Emily, it's our favorite time of year. What do you got? Well, we've got all the tricks and treats you can handle, Bill. It's Shocktober, as we like to call it at Hollywood Suite, which means we're playing as many horror movies as we can. Everything from The Exorcist, the version you've never seen before. What, what, wait, the- what, 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 what? A version I've never seen before? Yeah, there's many versions of The Exorcist, as you know. <laughs> okay, but, uh, all right. But you you got to see this one because you've never seen it before. Correct. Uh, um, also, we've got The Lost Boys, which is a fan favorite. Yeah. Everybody loves it but we've got scream and we're premiering get out finally the Ooh. iconic modern horror masterpiece by jordan peele it's finally coming to the service on the other side of the pond we have a series called the wreck coming it's an exclusive to hollywood suite series it's set on a cruise ship it's about a killer wearing a duck mask I'm telling you, you've got to watch it. It came to Hulu in the States, but it's finally landing here in Canadian waters on Hollywood Suite on October 5th. I highly recommend it. Well, there it is. It's wreck. Go see it. It's cheaper than taking a real cruise and twice as scary. Thanks, Emily. (laughs) Thanks, Bill. Well, you've loved her on Mary Makes It Easy. Now she's cooking up a whole new series called The Good Stuff with Mary Berg. What's it all about, Mary? It's called The Good Stuff with Mary Berg. And um, when we were talking about it and kind of developing the idea and working through what it was actually going to look like, um, the main thing we kept coming back to is just filling people's lives up and that doesn't mean with like big always big flashy things but just sharing stories from people doing good things from across Canada Mm -hmm. sharing stories by from people who are maybe more well known who are doing good things Mm -hmm. um there will obviously Mm -hmm. still be food every day I'm gonna cook something up that you can make at home have cook-alongs with different chefs hopefully get some guests to cook along because I want to convince people that anybody can actually cook um but I'm really excited to learn I'm a lifelong trier (laughs) and I am so looking forward to learning from the different experts we're going to have on. That's the good stuff with Mary Berg weekdays at 10 a.m. on CTV. Back with my special guest, Cheryl Hickey. Did you ever, uh, Robin Williams, who's always be a, a, a oh, counter, Robin. I would think, right? He, okay. So I don't remember what it was for, but I did run into Robin Williams and I love him the way everyone else loves him because he's yeah. such a legend. And I asked him if he would sing Oh Canada and he just did not crush it and made it amazing. And uh, that was just a really funny, beautiful moment. And yeah, the world is 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 definitely empty without a man like him. But I had let, a great moment with him. Let me throw a few other names at you. Tom Cruise. Okay. Tom Cruise. Funny story, Tom Cruise. We have him into the studio for the very, very first time. Everyone has to sign NDAs. It was wild. We do a great interview. It goes well. Hug it out. Like, great connection. Amazing. He leaves. We get a call from his people. Tom's lost his cell phone. <laughs> You guys need to lock it down in there. That cell phone is somewhere in the building. Almost accusatory, but not really. Like they were just like, where's the phone? (laughs) Of course, we all turn into like mother hens and we are looking for Tom Cruise's phone. We are looking in everyone's bags. We're looking under every jacket, every battery pack, like you name it. We are going and production is shut down. We are looking and we get a phone call. Oh, it's in the bottom of his bag. Not to worry. We found it. And everyone's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's our Tom Cruise story. But he was lovely. He was so kind. 
That's okay. what I've heard. Uh, okay, how about uh, I re- Quincy Jones? There's a great oh. name. Oh, Tell me yeah. your Quincy Jones story. So Quincy Jones is a is a person who's touched everyone's career. If you name an artist, yeah. he's probably produced it, touched it, helped it grow. Period. End stop. Comes into town. He wrote a book, and we go to the Four Seasons. I think it was, and we sit down. We start the interview, um, and for whatever reason, again. I clicked over into the Owen Sound, the Shallow Lake, the right? And I felt the click. Like I know when I'm interviewing someone and the click happens, like I can feel that thing where you just forget that you're interviewing and you're having a conversation, similar to what we're doing here today. Mm. And all of a sudden, 30 minutes has gone by. And you know, in our world, you usually get 10 minutes. Yeah. Five. Like I got to go. I'm behind. He's telling stories of. He's had brain aneurysms. He's been married multiple times. He's talking about, <laughs> he's talking about all the artists that he's touched, like such rich history. Yeah. He leaves, we're packing up. And all of a sudden a knock comes at the door, like 20 minutes later, I'm helping the cameraman get the tripod, like get everything down and knock on the door. He comes back in. He's like, is there any chocolate in the fridge? And I'm like, I think there is like, you, we can check and we Fred, we find it. He sits back down and he goes, I really enjoyed our conversation. Do you have anything else you want to ask me? I looked yeah, at my cameraman. I was like, pop it back up. So we <laughs> the camera back up. And we started again and we got a little bit more and it was wonderful. How rare is that? That's fantastic. Um, yeah. All right, Nicole Kidman. Wow, you're pulling some out. Nicole Kidman, red carpet, uh, Toronto International Film Festival. I am standing in a packed line with a bunch of people. But back then it was like a line, like an L. So there was a line of press and then there was a line of fans. And I was right in the corner and I was standing there and there was a fan very excited to see Nicole with a clipboard. And as he was trying to get to her, I'm talking to her. Okay. As this is happening, he's smashing me on the head what? with the clipboard. And I'm trying to not pretend this is happening. It's Nicole Kidman. She then grabs the clipboard, puts her arm around me, and she says, I forget exactly what she said, but she basically protected me from the clipboard. Wow. Well, it shows up. Someone took a picture of it, and then it ends up in the paper the next day in, like, the Toronto Sun or the Stars. One of them. That's wild. That Nicole Kidman saved me. (laughs) <laughs> so that was my yeah. uh, did you ever meet a beetle oh my gosh did i ever meet a beetle i want to say yes but i don't know oh i think at the grammys i did okay i think i did at the grammys probably paul or ringo i'm guessing yeah it was paul i think i think it was yeah. paul pretty yeah. good yeah. uh okay and then brad pitt oh <laughs> so um i'm at yes good good one i am i am uh, at uh in Cannes for the film festival and i'm in my two by two room if anyone who's ever covered it knows that the rooms in Cannes are very small right and i get a call one day that says from my producer says hey entertainment tonight something's happened either person was flying in couldn't get in or something happened Entertainment Tonight wants you to go down on the beach and interview Brad Pitt, Don Cheadle, Matt Damon, and George Clooney for Oceans. They oh, my God. It, but the interview will be not just for ET Canada. It's also going to be for Entertainment Tonight Canada. My wow. whole body went like I was just lost it. You know, everything goes through your mind of, oh, my gosh, can I do this? This is big exposure. This is all the th- Anyway. So I just remember taking my shoes off and walking in the burning hot sand (laughs) up to this area where there were three director's chairs, a chair for me, two cameras sitting down. And then suddenly there was Brad Pitt sitting with Don Cheadle and I was interviewing them and it was the wildest thing ever. Like it was just, and then he left and George Clooney came in and then he left and Matt Damon came in. And I just remember being like, what is my life right now? Like, what <laughs> is my life right now? Who do I think I am? That's pretty but cool. But being funny and kind and wonderful. Did so, you yeah. play Did you play the Shallow Lake card with those of guys? Of course. Yeah? Oh, well, I didn't mention Shallow Lake, but I certainly was conscious of 
we're just people. Like we have to be just people. Yeah, yeah. I'm a girl from Shallow Lake. These are people from wherever they came from. Yeah. And we have to find a common moment in conversation. That's always my goal. Mm-hmm. What can connect us? How can we get lost in conversation together and just be that? Very smart. Uh, how about uh, some Canadians? Uh, you know, obviously, uh, Kiefer, uh, you know, some, some of the folks you've oh. met over the years. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's my Kiefer story. <laughs> <laughs> so my Kiefer story goes like this. I yeah. was a huge fan, am a fan of 24. Loved it. My husband and I used to watch it, all the things. We get an opportunity to go down to, um, we get an opportunity to go to England to be on set of 24. And not only be on set of 24, but they're going to give me a walk-on role. Like, are you kidding me? Wow. I love Kiefer. I love this show. This is everything. So I go down with my friend, Jesse. We Jesse Barkley, we became very, very good friends yeah, for yeah. BT Canada. Still right. are. Um, and we go. And <laughs> they asked us to, we were in a train station. So they said, uh, no, his PR people said, listen, you guys stay up here at the train station. Cheryl, you go down, get ready for your shot. Kiefer's arriving. You can get a nice shot of him coming out of his car and going down into the station. It's great. So I'm down there eagerly awaiting to see him thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing. This, I can't wait. So I guess what happens is Kiefer gets out of his car. Our camera is shooting a video of him getting out of his car. He comes down kind of barreling towards me. And I think, oh my gosh, like we're going to, this is amazing. He's excited to see me. He walks up to me and says, can I talk to you over here? Yes. Thinking he wants to talk about the scene. We go over. He's mad. He is furious that I would have my cameraman film him as he's coming out of his car and we could have caused a huge distraction and possibly endangered the crew and did it. He was mad. Wow. And walks away. And I'm standing there now just absolutely floored, not knowing what happened. And they're like, okay, and everybody in their places, we need to start the scene. You know what the scene was? Me standing in the turnstile, and Kiefer has to come by and bang my shoulder as he rushes by me. I'm like, oh, my God, he's already mad at me. And we're going to do this? <laughs> so the scene goes on, and sure enough, he walks by and gives me a shoulder. That's what he was supposed to do because it was the scene because yeah. he was running. And then that was the last time I saw Kiefer. Oh, my goodness. So Kiefer sad. Sutherland gave you the shoulder. Um, yeah, but he had to. He had to give me the shoulder. He did. But I think the thing, you know, it's it's always, things are always lost in translation. Kiefer's, obviously, his PR people didn't tell him that we were going to be there to shoot him coming out and that everything was okay. So, again, you only know what you don't know, but... Yeah. So he I, was just looking out for the crew, but yeah. Well, that's quite a story. I, I, I too actually talked to Kiefer. They did like a ninth season of 24 in London or something. Right? I remember yes, talking yes. to him in, in London as well. Yeah. And, uh, but no one invited me to do a scene or I didn't get shouldered. So <laughs> you were way ahead. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, my goodness. So um, last, like a week ago, it was the last episode, I believe, of ET Canada that we're talking okay. here. Uh, and um, and I believe they're going to show best of shows right through the end of this month. Right, Cheryl? Yeah, that's what they, yeah, they're going to show uh, best of. Yeah. Uh, but you've had a week for this to sort of sink in. Well, where are you at with this now? Are you, um, is there a point where you're just kind of, I mean, 18 years is incredible on television. On one show, it's, I mean, I don't know, even have the words for it. It's fantastic. Um, uh, what, where are you now? What are you thinking? How are you processing all of this at this point? Yeah, I think I'm very nostalgic, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Sure does. I have, yeah. I have um, I've, I've been a global for, for 24 years. Yeah. So I have 24 years of, uh, memories, 24 years of garments, shoes. You wouldn't believe it. I had to go through seven rolling racks of clothes and we had 10 bins of shoes. So we we're making a ton of donations. That's what I've spent my last two days doing, organizing all of that. Wow. Um, we're going to be donating a lot to charity. Um, 
and doing some really great things with a lot of it. Um, so I think, how am I feeling? I'm very nostalgic, very, like I met my husband. Ooh, I'm going to cry again. Um, I met my husband on that show. Uh, if I w- it wasn't for that show, I wouldn't have met him. There was a, an assistant director, Jillian Parker, that set me up on a blind date. Nice. To go out with my husband. Um, I wouldn't have my kids. So I feel like the show gave me a lot of things. And I also feel in turn, I gave a lot to global. I, I, I did a lot with the network, um, a lot of building, a lot of promotion. So it was a beautiful exchange of energy over the years. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Um, so I'm, and I'll, I'll tell you this in all honesty, I, in the last two years have felt a wave of change coming, not saying that I knew it was coming, but I also knew that I was wanting more. Mm. And, um, so when it did happen, was I surprised? Yes. But was it an unearthing in me? No. Had it have happened maybe five years before, maybe it would have been, but I feel like in my heart, I knew it was time for a change again. And so I'm sitting with that. I know that, I mean, part of the justification I read was that global chorus, uh, the the costs of uh, uh, a daily entertainment show in an environment where the ad revenue is not what it once was, was just too much of a challenge, right? Mm-hmm. And and we've seen this. I mean, I r- used to <laughs> wrote for newspapers and magazines. They ain't there anymore. And if they are, they've got like a little page like this for entertainment. It's, it's uh, you know, do, do you feel in some ways it wasn't competition, but maybe the Internet, the, everybody having they can on demand call up um, information on on the stars. Uh, was that really what caught up to a show like uh, Entertainment Tonight? Or, or do you think it was just the changes in Canadian television? I think it was a mix of all those things. I really do believe, though, that you can get your information anywhere. You can. You can get it off the Internet. You can get it. Newspapers still. There's things that you can do. However, the difference is the human connection and who you get your information for from. You you get the information and you keep coming back because you care about the people who are delivering it. People come back to your podcast, Bill, because they like you and they like how you how you go about and you ask questions and you make people feel. And it's about a feeling. So is the industry changing? Absolutely. But the human condition is still the human condition. And if I like getting my information from so-and-so, if I like the way someone makes me feel, that's my husband. I like Hi the way there. he makes me feel. He's he <laughs> but if uh, uh, your excuse, um, <laughs> my husband, for those who are just listening, my husband just walked in and walked through the shop with the dog. Um, <laughs> But I feel like we have to remember we are humans and human connection and who you get your information from, it matters. Whether it's a talk show, whether it is an entertainment show, that will still prevail. Mm -hmm. Those connections will still prevail. Now, is the advertising challenging right now? Absolutely. The world is challenging right now. Yeah. And But you and I both know we remember 2008. We remember that things dip and they come back. They yeah. dip and they come back. Mm-hmm. And there is a cycle, right? I yeah. believe all things will come back, but they will be different. They will. And there always is a cycle. And you're absolutely right. Um, the thing that I think, though, is the uh, hardest part of all of this is that, you know, this has been going on since I started working at TV Guide, but the challenges at, with a Canadian star system are um, really, really tremendous. And uh, a show like Entertainment Tonight Canada, ET Canada, eTalk, others, they're vital in in that there's no place for Canadians generally to meet uh, the Canadian uh, talent, whether it's be directors or producers or, or writers or actors, than these shows. Um, who's going to do this now? You know, are, are, uh, to me, that's the biggest worry, right? Well, when we started our show, our our biggest mandate was we want to, you know, make you feel at home with the stars that you love, but also we want to build stars and show you why you should care about these people. Because if we care, you know, hopefully you'll care also. Mm-hmm. So you're right. That that is a major gap. And my hope is that people lean in to our friends at eTalk and that they support their show. 
and they watch their show and they share clips from that show because these shows are important, whether it's eTalk or maybe it's a lifestyle show. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a hybrid of more lifestyle shows that meld into entertainment because you will be able to do those ad dollars from lifestyle products and entertainment. And I feel like that's the next generation of those kinds of shows yep. where you will highlight Canadian talent, but you will also be able to make money. That's how I think it's going to go. And I think we'll see one of those shows starring Cheryl Hickey, right? Oh, look at us. Yes. <laughs> I well, love that. It seems only natural. Um uh, listen, uh, I want to just quickly uh, ask some questions I ask everybody as we wrap things up. And thank you for being so generous with your time, Cheryl. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Um, uh, you and your husband, do you have favorite shows that you're watching right now? What are you streaming? What are you watching? What do you never miss? Dave, do we have a show we're watching right now? Netflix. We're watching the Beckham documentary. Oh, absolutely. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. Now, when I say we're watching, he chooses to watch it late at night. I fall asleep really quick. So I'm catching up in between. But that's our show right now. All right. And and then you've got, of course, uh, Beckham uh, and uh, um, Posh, Posh Spice there uh, is, is his famous wife. But talk about fashion. You mentioned about all these clothes and everything. There's yes. these great photos of you over the years. There's one I, I when I was preparing for this, you're standing on a downtown toronto skyscraper you're in this oh. starry dress the cn tower it's a spectacular shot your hair yeah. the shoes uh, i hope you get to keep some of these right <laughs> oh yes well this is the problem so i've spent the last two days going through things um and keeping a lot of them i found actually my very first dress that i ever went to a gala in yeah. Yeah. And when I came to Toronto, I've kept that. I've kept some really interesting, a dress from Fairweather that I cut and made into a red carpet Grammy dress that no, I just kept telling everyone it was vintage. Wow. Um, but it costs like 19 bucks. So I've kept some really important things, but I'm also planning on doing some fun things on social and donating them and shipping to people that I just think people should have. So yeah, we're going to do some fun things. Good for you. And you must be kind of relieved in a way. I know I've uh, had experiences where I've worked places and then um, uh, either they went away or I went away. And uh, mm -hmm. actually that those times are special looking back because you rarely get a chance to look all the way around in life. You're always so focused on the task at hand. Uh, is there something about this? And you have young children, so you must be in some ways – um, pleased to have this opportunity to spend more time with them and, and just your own aspirations, right? I will say that I am, I, I'm always a person who tries to be really present. So when the big things and the good things are happening, when ET Canada was on, mm -hmm. I was very aware and I'm watching and grateful and realizing, whoa, like I was, I never took it for granted, but you're right. Stepping out of it, there is an awareness that is new and and really amazing. Um, I think having my dad pass in January, I was very, I was pretty quick with my grieving because I had to get back up on that stage and pretend everything was okay. Mm. So I think you know I am taking some time to process. It's been a big year for me in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a lot of um, oh, there's my dog and my hubs. See ya. She's going golfing. Oh, good for her. Um, <laughs> so there's been a lot of processing, and I think I'm going to do that. But also, I'm not a person who idles well. So you bet, you bet that I'm that I'm busy, that I'm figuring things out. Yeah. Like I, I, I love what I do. I love what we do. I love our industry so mm -hmm. much, uh, and I have a lot more to go. There's a lot to do. Anything you would want to talk about at this point, or you're still percolating? I love you, Bill, but I cannot <laughs> do the thing. Well, listen, um, uh, Cheryl, why has it been so long since that helicopter ride? I'm so sorry that I uh, just let you, you do your thing. You bailed on me. I, I you did. No, I did. I, well, I figured you were fine, I, you know, so, uh, <laughs> but, but this, I has had been, you fooled. this has been a wonderful catch up. Uh, but please, I'm hoping to be uh, one of the first in line at your next venture because I really would like to continue our conversation. It's It's been amazing. Amazing. You have such a great story and oh. I'm a big fan. Um, well, I just want you to know that I am so grateful that you even thought of me to oh, have me of on the show. 
Um, you were such a supporter back then, and it's kind of serendipitous that as this chapter ends, that I get to talk to you. So I'm really very grateful and very appreciative that you that you took the time to do this. It is entirely my pleasure, and uh, thank you for all your time. Just I want to sneak in these last two quickies. Yeah. Uh, when sure. you were a youngster, perhaps growing up in uh, Own Sound, did you have a favorite TV show then? What was the show that you used to race home from school to see or you watched as a, as a kid? Yes. Um, so when we moved into the big city of Owen Sound, everybody <laughs> had cable but us when we lived where we gr- grew up. So I was very excited that we got um, Growing Pains. Ah. <laughs> I was very, very excited about that. But I also have very vivid memories of me laying on the couch and watching Mary Hart on Entertainment Tonight. Nice. So there those you go. were my shows. Those were, that was it. Obviously had a big impact. Did you ever interview Alan Thicke? Did I ever interview Alan Thick? I don't think I did. I, don't think, yeah, I, I, don't I know, know uh, some, some of my crew members did. Uh, and actually, one of my producers was one of his personal assistants for a long time. Wow. Um, there you go. But no, I, I didn't get the pleasure of doing he, that. He was one of the stars of Growing Pains, of course. Now, last but not least, your favorite all-time TV theme song. I th- I think I might know what it is, but uh, let's let's hear it. What, what was your favorite? Show me that smile again. I don't get words of song. I just, I, I'm really terrible at that. But yeah, that would be my theme. I love that. That's a bonus. The getting getting to hear you sing it. Is... That one. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, you know, uh, getting to hear you sing it saves us from getting into a royalty fight uh, by, oh, by playing it. So, no, no, thank you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to name Entertainment Tonight's TV theme, which, uh, you oh, know. Oh, so love that. Da, yeah. da, 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 ba, da, ba, ba. yeah, love that too. Also God, good. Gotta love that. Well, listen, um, Enjoy the rest of your day uh, and congrats on a tremendous career and all your great work. Always so impressive on Entertainment ET Canada. Uh, And uh, my goodness, uh, I'm really excited to see what's next. Please keep me in the loop. And uh, I will. I promise you 100%. I will. I will let you know. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I love the Cheryl Lake stories. I'm going to be driving by there. Sunday, I'm closing the cottage. I'm going to stop in and get a cone. Is it Allen's? What's the name of the store? It, well, at the time, it was Ed Allen's store. Like, it was Ed Allen's. Yeah. Where uh-huh. can I ask you? I don't know if we're, we don't want to tell everyone where you live, but can you, where's the cottage? Cottage is in Oliphant, which is north of Sobel Beach. I know all of it. Yes. Okay. All right. It's just okay. up. Yeah. So I know I've yeah. wasted a lot of time at the Dairy Queen at Sobel. Now, of course, everybody's at the June Motel, right? I know. I Do you know I haven't stayed at the June Motel yet? I do need to go. I need to do that. I think you need to, to run a June Motel. I think you need the <laughs> June Motel TV show. The, the two women who have launched that venture are doing quite well. So yeah. Yeah. they did very well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Great to talk. Thank to you. you. Okay. We'll talk soon. Take care. Bye bye. As long as we got each other, the theme to the 1980s sitcom Growing Pains was Cheryl's pick as her all-time favorite TV theme song. It was not, however, written by Alan Thicke, who starred opposite Joanna Kearns on the sitcom. Thicke co-wrote several other themes for other sitcoms, such as Different Strokes and Facts of Life. The Growing Pains theme, however, was written by Steve Dorff and lyricist John Bettis. It was sung by a couple of great voices from that era, B.J. Thomas and Jennifer Warrens. Thanks as always to Phil Hong for producing this podcast. My thanks as well to the many publicists who bring great guests to the show each week, especially on this occasion, Adrian Kakoulis. Big thanks to our sponsors, Hollywood Suite, Paramount Plus, CTV and Super Channel. Special thanks to BJ Del Conte, Paul Boudra, and the Crispy Critters for the theme and incidental music used on the show. Finally, thanks to you, listener. If you liked what you heard, please favor us with a like or a review. I'm Bill Brio. Thanks for listening. <laughs>